This is something that you want to watch or listen to before you send your kids back to school. And I don't just mean government-run schools. Today, we're going to be talking about a host of issues, a host of curriculum that have made their way into schools all over the country. This isn't just happening in pockets in San Francisco or New York City. You will be shocked to find out what it is your kids are being exposed to. And the real question that you're going to have to answer is, what can you do about it? All of that and more coming up on this episode of Making the Argument. For anyone who likes to watch Angry Nick, this might be the episode for you. Uh, if you're driving home this afternoon, be sure to keep your eyes on the road because you might get a bit angry over the topic of today's discussion. But thank you for joining us on this episode of Making the Argument. If you learned something valuable, I hope you'll let us know in the YouTube comment section as well as leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And don't forget, the volley link to join us on that platform is in the description of this podcast. And we hope to see you there to discuss this issue after the show. All right. I am your host, Nick Freitas, member of the Virginia House of Delegates, but other than that, a good guy. And for the purposes of this discussion, I will also mention that I serve on the House Education Committee as well as the chairman of the Higher Education Subcommittee. So some of this information that I'm bringing you today is coming from someone that has actually seen what's going on with respect to policy discussions, at least in Virginia. But you're going you're gonna to see that a lot of this applies all over the place. Not with us today is the queen of the bees. She stepped out to get some milk. Did we'll, she? we'll see if she comes back. <laughs> I'm as here always, though. <laughs> as always, our uh, resident historian and political prognosticator, Christian Hines. Hey, how you doing? And producer of producers, Nicholas Hamilton. The good Hamilton, the one that doesn't like central banking. Real quick, Nick, this is an important conversation. Let's just go ahead and get the critical race theory topic out of the way and cover that. What have you been hearing regarding critical race theory in schools, parents, you know, all around. Okay, so we, we've gone over critical race theory before. I'm not, we're not gonna, we won't go into too much depth about it, but I wanted to point something out because you still have people claiming that critical race theory appears nowhere within your, your kid's education. All right, and first and foremost, let's just give it a fairly good definition of what critical race theory is, all right, from you know, one of the definitions. It's a cross-disciplinary intellectual and social movement of civil rights scholars and activists who seek to examine the intersection of race, society, and law in the United States and to challenge mainstream American liberal approaches to racial justice. That's even probably too narrow of a definition. Really what this is, is CRT is kind of a, a legal theory and concept. It is a lens by which you view the world. So when you see disparities taking place in society, all right, Generally, CRT comes to the conclusion that those disparities take place as a result, right, within the United States, as a result of systemic racism and institutional racism within American legal, political, social, and economic structures, right? And obviously, they can point to things like slavery. They can point to things like Jim Crow laws. They can point to things, you know, all throughout American history, which, which reinforce this idea that obviously there was institutional systemic racism. But... If you go to the extent that people like Ibram X. Kendi go and like Robin D'Angelo go, right? Instead of saying, this is something that explains certain disparities and therefore we have to ask important questions about how we're going to deal with it, right? Or to what extent it has had an effect on American society, Kendi, D'Angelo, they go to the extent of, no, 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 this explains disparities. And the only way that you can make up for past discrimination is through current discrimination. And oh, by the way, the only way you can be an anti-racist is to be an anti-capitalist. That's Kendi. And oh, by the way, you know, and yeah, we have a Congress and all, and we have, you know, a president, we have state legislation, that's all fine. But you know what we really need? We need a federal department of anti-racism, which can automatically nullify federal, state, and local law if the experts which who are, who are not elected, by the way, determine that whatever legislation is not sufficiently anti-racist, right? So the important thing to understand is that it is, it is a critique of pretty much all of American society, which offers policy prescriptions on how to deal with these problems that, that they think explain most, most everything. And it's built out of critical theory. Right. Okay. Critical theory is from the Frankfurt School. It's very, very influenced by Marx, by, you know, Hegel. It's influenced by Freud. But again, if, you, if one of the things that you, you notice between all these critical theories, whether it's, whether it's critical theory, critical race theory, a couple of common things. Very, very anti-free market, very anti-capitalist, very, very skeptical of uh, what we call classical liberalism, property rights, free market economics. Very critical of uh, religion in general, but specifically Christianity. Very critical of that. And, and generally in favor of a more socialist approach to society in general. 
So it's not that critical race theory just popped up one day. It is a right. branch of critical theory. Now, here's the question. All right, with the, now, if you agree with that, you might think, I don't care if that's in my school. But here's what I find interesting. Some of the people that loudly agree with CRT have all promised us that it is not in our schools. Well, we're going to go up and pull up a picture right here. And this is from, uh, this is a screenshot. Now, this has since been taken down when Governor Youngkin got elected. All right. But this is a screenshot of the basic, basic tenets. Yeah, go stop. Yeah, basic tenets of anti-racist education. If you zoom in on this real quick, you're going to notice a couple of things. Because the same people that were telling us, no, 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 we're not doing CRT in your classroom. That, that's nowhere in your kid's curriculum. Okay, well, you go to the Virginia Department of Education website, right? This is what used to be up there. And where is it? Oh, it's excerpts from Robin D'Angelo's book, White Fragility. And Robin D'Angelo is one of these people that the moment you say, hey, look, I have a problem because I don't think CRT does a good job of explaining this, or I, I don't think CRT adequately explains X. Oh, that's your white privilege speaking, right? So any critique you offer of CRT she uses as evidence that you're actually racist. So there's no way to critique it. There, there's no way to do critical analysis of critical race theory because then they could just come back and say, oh, well, any sort of critique you have of it is proof that it actually exists. That's postmodernism Thank at you. its heart right there. Thank you. Right now, let's scroll down a little bit more. Terms and definition. Well, you'll notice that the anti-racist definition is given by who? Oh, Ibram X. Kendi. Right, so like two of the most prominent advocates of not just CRT as a theory or as a lens through looking through the world, but who have offered very specific policy prescriptions, they're the ones that the Virginia Department of Education chose to use in order to come up with their terms and definitions for the training that they were requiring your teachers to go through. Scroll down some more. Now, there was another component in here. You're going to have to zoom out a little bit. There was another component here that I thought was interesting because, again, they would say, you know, you, you point this out, you would point this out, zoom out some more. Okay. You're going to have to get that whole thing in there. All right. You would point out that, well, wait a second. You're telling me that CRT isn't anywhere in our kid, in our kids education, but then I'm going to the Virginia department of education website and I'm seeing where you quote Kindy and D'Angelo. I'm like, oh, well you, we use them for some of our terms, but that doesn't mean it's going into your kid's classroom. Oh, okay. Well, great. So you see up here and this, you still can find online. You go here and it was, this is, uh, this is an excerpt from one of the newsletters that they send out. So they've got a part on here for it's, um, they're sending teachers to places in order to get lesson plans. So you see this LGBTQ plus students, LGBTQ plus history month resources. This comes from teaching tolerance. Then you have racial equity and anti-racism. You'll see again, anti-racist action for white educators, teaching tolerance. What's teaching tolerance? Oh, well, it's a part of the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is an extreme left-wing organization that actually once listed Ben Carson as a hateful extremist on their website, right? So we're not talking about some sort of like neutral education place that is going through and providing, you know, just, you know, generic resource. No, 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 they have an agenda. But here's the best one is that educate to liberate. So this is what the Virginia Department of Education was recommending teachers go to in order to find lessons planned. So what's Educate to Liberate? Well, it's build an anti-racist classroom from Edutopia. So what did I do? I clicked on that. I pretended I'm a teacher looking for a lesson plan in order to help my kids. So I go to this. Oh, look at that. And then it talks about uh, the uh, pedagogy of and for difference. And then they offer a book. In Critical Pedagogy, the State and Cultural Struggle, Henry Garot writes about the importance of the you know, difference and in, in, uh, in basically pedagogy. You're talking about creating like a lessons plan and a structure for teaching, right? So you go to his book and let's look at the reviews for his book. Personally, I can, so this is a review for the book that they're encouraging your teachers to use. Personally, I consider the approach the authors of this book have taken to be among the most advanced approaches in school research. It draws from anthropolo anthropology, uh, semiotics, and Marxist, th Marxist theory and hermeneutics. So again, when they tell you that they were not trying to push critical race theory in your school, here's what you need to understand. They don't mean that, yeah, we're going to put CRT on your kid's curriculum. They're smart enough to know they can't get away with doing that. So they did something arguably much worse. They required as part of teacher licensure in the Commonwealth of Virginia for all of your teachers to go through this training where there was a whole list of seminars in there. And, and lo and behold, there weren't any seminars done by the Heritage Foundation or the Cato Institute, right? Really? 
Or the Manhattan Institute. No, no, no. It turns out... Nobody taught you about Bastiat. No, yeah. Nothing in there about Frederick Bastiat. Nothing in there about different educational alternatives. Nothing in there. Nope. It was all from organizations like this that were pushing a, a, a host of theories that all originate with critical theory, which, again, is rooted in Marx, Hegel, and Freud. Right? All of the major thinkers, like you know uh, Herbert Marcuse, when, they're all associated with the new left. So think of all the different, you know, student groups, like social student groups within the 60s and 70s, postmodernism, deconstructionism, that's what it was. That is what they were providing for your teachers. So instead of actually taking CRT into like a high school, maybe AP history class and saying, okay, CRT is one of the ways that you can actually view American history and as well as American social life, political life, economic life. And here's some other theories, and we're, and we're going to go ahead and do an analysis of various theories, right? That's one way they could have done, done that, but they didn't. Instead, what they said was, hey, teachers, here's how we expect you to teach, and here's the places that we recommend you go to for lesson plans. So really what they were doing is we want our teachers to teach whatever subject they teach through this lens, to simplify what I, I think I think a really good way to like sum up the argument that, that conservatives really need to be making on this, or libertarians for that matter, is that it's it's critical race theory, not critical race practice. That's a good point. Everybody seems to be thinking, and, and you get this all the time from the left. I remember Nick's Democrat opponent when he was running for re-election last year to the House of Delegates, like went into one of these public forums that they were having and literally said, CRT is not being taught in our schools. And the funny thing is, is that the same people that were voting for her and clapping and being like, oh man, you really owned Nick, are the same people that wish it were being taught yeah. in, in schools. But the thing is, it is being taught in schools because as Nick said, it's not like you have a class titled critical race theory because it's a theory. It's a, it, what it is, is it's a worldview is what it is. It's it's a lens through which you view reality. And that lens is entirely built around power structures. Everything is about power structures according to critical theory. It's it, and 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 so the race part is is power structures around race, but there's other components to it too, which is at its core this is what marxism is. Marx is like when we use terms like marxism, let alone things like cultural Marxism. These are loaded terms that people immediately think yeah. that we're either being conspiracy theorists or we're being right-wing radicals or something like that. But no, from an intellectual perspective, these terms actually have meaning, even though people want to distort them. Marxism and cultural Marxism is a worldview that is built around the idea that everything is just about power structures. That's what Marxism is. It's the idea that, that you know, the bourgeoisie are oppressing the proletariat who need to seize the means of production yeah. in order to create a socialist utopia. But when you view all of human interaction in history and philosophy and culture and theology and economics and everything in between – as just power structures and nothing else, what you're doing is you're basically stripping away the humanity of the people that you're you're interacting with. Well, and, and keep in mind, when you look at CRT, like if you look at common themes of CRT, and they, they list them, like critique of liberalism, uh, storytelling and counter-storytelling, and naming one's own reality, right? Standpoint epistemology. Think of that as, oh, it's not your truth, that's my truth. Um Things like uh, revisionist interpretations of the American civil rights law. So they're very critical of the American civil rights movement because they feel like um, it, it basically covered over for the structural racism that still exists and is inherent in the system. Um, they they, uh, they advance the idea of storytelling or narrative over critical thinking, linear thought, hmm. scientific empirical method, thought. empirical analysis. Like they... they again, that, these are elements of whiteness. You actually saw this in the Smithsonian where they listed linear thinking and uh, quantitative um, analysis and scientific method as elements of whiteness, which oh, I they went was a, further a pretty racist thing to do. They said hardworking. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and timeliness and yeah. things like that. Or, or, uh, first off though, I mean, what a racist thing to say that apparently yeah. black and Hispanic and Asian people can't be hardworking yeah, or, or use yeah. sci the scientific or method. use the scientific method. Yeah. But like, uh, yeah, who knew that the, I'm, I'm pretty sure the Chinese scientists that were inventing all kinds of things <laughs> yeah. while London was a series of like mud huts are fascinated to find out that the, you know, 
Yeah. Your reasoning is a whiteness, you know, attribute. It, 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 it's so, if you're a fan of like history or world history, it's it's actually quite laughable that, that we project this like, because in the United States, we just view everything as black and white because that's what our history has been, you know, because we inherited slavery from the European slave trade and, you know, we, in, and, and, and that, you know, that led into, it because for most of the world, most of the world throughout history, because almost every single culture has practiced some form of discrimination and especially slavery throughout history. Yeah. But the Western world, the New World in particular, the United States, Brazil, the Caribbean, were one of the only places in the world where that was done through a, a race-based system, right? Where the Romans were were equal opportunity enslavers. They didn't really care what your skin color was. They enslaved everybody. They yeah. enslaved the Carthaginians, the Seleucids, the Jews, the the Germans, et cetera, et cetera. But in the Western world, it was it was based on race, and so because of that, CRT finds it, it is it's easier to be exploited here than in other countries because we sometimes think of this as a uniquely universal thing, when, when in reality, things like slavery and discrimination have existed everywhere. But because it was different here, well, okay, but even it's that's easier not, for it to be pushed on people, I feel it, like. It is until you recognize, okay, so first of all, slavery wasn't different in the West until later on in history. Like, that's kind of the interesting thing to take into consideration. Because when you talk about the West, you got to include the Greeks, you got to include the Romans, you got to I was trying the, to say the, the New World. Okay, the Britons, the Gauls, everybody, right? S slavery was common. Mm-hmm. And, and it wasn't race-based slavery. Now, there was still discrimination, right? Like, you know, there was there was the Romans and then there was the barbarians, yes. right? Like, so you, you had that sort of discrimination. And then the Chinese did the same thing. There were the, there were the Han. They were the Middle Kingdom. There were the Han or the yeah. Jin, and then there were the barbarians, right? Yeah. Like, it, it was usually a distinction that people made between civilized society and nomadic tribes and, and things like that. What happened, in the, what happened in the West, especially like in the New World and whatnot, was that as ideas, specifically abolitionist movements associated with Christianity, as they started to take hold, people had to come up with moral justifications for slavery, right? So in, in most of the world, they, they didn't care about the moral justification. Of I'm stronger. That's my moral justification, right? Right. Um, however, when you, when you went into certain cultures where now all of a sudden you had like, no, you can't enslave your fellow people. That's where you started to see these groups come up. It's like, oh, well, no, that's a different type of person. That's a different species of person. And that's how they used to justify the institution of slavery when it was falling out of favor within societies that were saying this is not morally tenable. So they were trying to find a way to make it morally tenable within a system that didn't allow for it. Yeah. And that's why it, that's, that's why it didn't survive. Um, because it is inherently wrong and false. It certainly doesn't fit in with, with Western notions of freedom. It certainly doesn't fit in with um, Christian notions of, of freedom and, and you know, humanity. But th the point of all of this, point of all is to bring this back. Anyone that tells you that they're not trying to push that in schools, it, it, okay, they're either grossly ignorant, and every once in a while I've seen teachers going like, well, I've never taught this. this hasn't, I'm not saying it's in your individual classroom. What I'm saying is anybody that tells you that they're not trying to go, I just showed you right here, right where an official Virginia Department of Education website was pushing this and was pushing stuff and then taking you outside of their website to other websites that were openly in favor of critical race theory. So does this mean all of this has changed now that Governor Yunkin is in? Uh, no. no. They've been able to change. Obviously, they've been able to change some policies at the top, but some of these things were put into law. Right? There's only so much jurisdiction that they have when you have law that you're supposed to execute. So, and, and not to mention the fact that in places like Idaho, where they did the reverse, like in Virginia, they enshrined this in law and put this into the teacher training, and, and the Virginia Department of Education has some authority within the new um, administration to change some of the resources and, the, and where they go. They can change some of it, but not all of it. In Idaho, they came right out and said, you're not teaching this in schools. And then an undercover reporter went in there and posed as two parents that were moving to Idaho from California and said, oh, well, you, you guys are still doing it, right? And they're like, well, we can't call it this. Now we have to call it this. But we're still able to get the same concepts through Idaho, people. Yeah. Right? We're not San Francisco, not Oakland, not New York City, right? Not Washington. is Idaho. So you need to understand that so much of what you're seeing right now 
It doesn't mean that every teacher's on board. It doesn't mean that every administrator's on board. But the ones that are on board with it are adamant about getting this into the classroom. They think it is absolutely critical to teach your child this. And in part, they think it's, criti- they think it's more critical to teach this to your child if you oppose it. Because you're a racist and a bigot, and they need to educate that right out of your kid. Last thing they need is a kid growing up to be like you. Well, Nick, what, how should a parent respond when somebody says that CRT is just teaching hard history? <laughs> okay. If a parent, if someone says, well, no, no, we're, you're just upset because we're going to teach about slavery. Well, first of all, can someone tell me the school in the last 20, 40 years in America where we haven't taught about the evils of slavery? Right. I mean, I'm sure they exist, but to, uh, to pretend as if this is just some sort of like rampant problem, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't see it. Um, and again, I sit on the education committee for right. the Commonwealth of Virginia. It's not like I am ignorant about what is being taught in our, in our schools here. Here's the thing that I, I posed to somebody once. I said, oh, okay, you want to teach hard history? All right, let's start with this. The most powerful, influential, well-financed organization in American history pushing white supremacy on an institutional level was the Democratic Party. Wow. I think we should, and that, that is a factually accurate statement. The most powerful, well-financed organization in American history pushing white supremacy was the Democratic Party. Oh, I've got, I've, I can one up you. Well, but wait. And then when they come back, I'm like, whoa, whoa, oh, yeah. But then the party, I'm like, whoa, 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 stop. Why are you letting your white, why are you letting your Democrat fragility get in the way of what we're talking about here? Why are you letting your white fragility, why don't you want to teach hard history? I, I, I want context. Oh, oh, now you want context with respect to the, oh, I see. So it's not good enough to just spit out a series of facts. You actually want context with respect to what we're talking about. So Thomas Jefferson is not just a slave owner. He's also the guy that wrote the Declaration of Independence. And maybe we should look at this through a view based off of the context of the time of what was going on, not to excuse slavery, but to understand the social norms then versus now and how people might have interacted with them. Oh, now you want context? Now you want context, yeah. No, see, they want con- the moment you say, okay, great, I'll, I'll see your hard history. Every single, every single Democrat president, all the way up to, you know, we'll leave Lyndon Johnson out, even though I think he could be included in this. In fact, we'll even leave Truman out. All of the Democrat presidents, FDR, Woodrow Wilson, right, the first progressive president, they were all unrepentant racists, and we should immediately tear down their statues and erase any memory of FDR or Woodrow Wilson. Well, we got to put this in, oh, we do now, huh? So... They're, they're lying to you. This is not just about teaching hard history because nobody should have a problem with teaching harder elements of history. What most people object to with respect to critical race theories or the advocates of critical race theory, when they want to teach hard history, they want to put it within a certain format to where they leave out the context that they don't find helpful to their overall end state. And their overall end state is not for you to just for your kid to have a better understanding of what happened during the Tulsa massacre in Oklahoma which they should know about. It's to push a particular narrative about our founding, about our institutions, about our economic systems. And when you start to reveal that, then all of a sudden it's like, okay, so I think one of the best things that you can do as a parent is say, okay, well then we should teach this as hard history. Because usually what you end up finding out is like, well, 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 we need, we need to, you know, there's more to it than just that. Oh, no kidding. So then I guess we can both agree that we should definitely teach hard and bad elements of U.S. history where we do a very strong critique of decisions that our government made or that we as a people made, but that we should also do it within the context of all of the other decisions that have also been made and the overall progress of the United States and how our institutions have actually proven that they can rise above bad decisions in the past and be successful, right? Well, no, they only want that insofar as it advances the political narrative that they want. So that's the thing to call them out on there. Well, Nick, real quick, I want to jump in before we go forward. What should the mindset of each parent be listening to this show right now as their kid, you know, starts classes again? What should they be thinking about? Well, so you should you should understand that the the government run school you went to, and I'm not going to apologize for calling it a government run school. I, like it's a pu- oh, it's a public school. Okay, roads are public, parks are public. You know why they're public? Because I can go on them any time. It's not just that taxpayer dollars fund them. Right. It's because I, as the public, have access to it. All right. Your kid doesn't have access to the public school one district away. Right. Right. That is a government run institution paid for by tax dollars, full of government employees, with all of the education and learning being approved by government officials. It's a government run school. Sorry, yeah. that's what it is. 
you need to make a decision. You need to understand that it's not the same institution you went to. And if you think it's going to get better just because you elected a new governor, you're not paying attention to the fact that all the stuff that we just mentioned with respect to things like critical race theory, you know where that starts? Higher education. Mm. Yeah. So there is about a 95% chance that if your kid's teacher you know, you know, w- went to any prominent public university, this stuff was going to be a part of their curriculum. This is how they were going to teach them to teach your child. And all of it from John Dewey to Herbert Mercuse to Marx to Derrida to Sartre to Camus, all of them were very, very hostile to what we who, who would. All, who were all these, those these people? These are all like postmodernist deconstruction. Okay. These are the people that make up so much of the postmodernist philosophy, the, even the modernist I've philosophy. I've got a question theory. that our audience might yeah. be interested in. Could you spend just like two or three minutes giving a really brief overview of what is postmodernism? So it, it's. it's, it's we, too I've used the phrase a lot. You've I know. Used po- it a lot. Postmodern. Look, like maybe we should do a whole episode dedicated to it. But again, postmodernism and existentialism, all of it was, was based off this idea that um, it, it was kind of getting away from objective truth and moving more toward like subjective reality or, or mm. perspective on reality. So your truth and my truth and this idea that there isn't some, you know, ultimate, you know, uh, you know, lawgiver like God, there isn't necessarily a, you know, an, an, a, an, a, an objective truth. Any, it's really about perspective and experience and, and narrative and understanding. And, and the element of truth to that is that, yes, all of us take a different perspective when mm-hmm. we look at reality and come to certain conclusions, but we shouldn't use that to then come to the conclusion that there is no ultimate reality or objective reality. There's just our perspective of it. Right. Um, so, all of this has is, is been feeding into how your teachers have been taught to teach your kids, all right? So before you send your kids in there, you need to understand some of the, the common theories that are going. We're going to talk about another one here that's really going to get you riled up as a parent. But where this stuff stems from, and then get to know your teacher. If you're going to send them into a public school, a government-run school, get to know your teacher, Understand the curriculum. Ask your kids important questions. And don't interrogate your kids. Oh, my gosh. For good sake. Don't treat your kids like they're the bad guys because they're asking questions yeah. based off of what they were taught at the school you sent them to. Yeah. Right? When they come home confused because you've taught them one thing and they've learned something else and they have hard questions about it, you got to be prepared to answer those. Right? And, that, and that's, that's good policy anyway. Like, I homeschool my kids. It's not that we don't go over various theories, worldviews, and perspectives. But I get to go over them in context, not to push the agenda of the schools. But I have my agenda that I'm pushing because I'm their parent. I love them far more than the government does. I want what's best for them far more than the government does. All right. So anyways, that's what parents should understand okay. going into this. And, and look, and if you don't like this or if you don't think it's something that you can adequately you know, fight against, then here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. Find an alternative. But... You should also know, and we're going to come, we're going to see this right now, just because you send them to private school doesn't mean they're not going to get this. So let's go into step two, right? Queer theory. So critical race theory, I think we've done a good job of demonstrating that regardless of what you're being told, it has made its way into your child's classroom in one way or another. Queer theory is another one that is becoming far more prevalent within your school at all age levels. I mean, I want everyone to keep in mind here is that a lot of what they were trying to do in Florida in actually a very neutral way, was saying, look, obviously we have some differences of opinion on these things, but regardless of where we stand on issues with respect to sex, how about we don't talk about it to third graders? And the left lost their minds. And what you all need to know is you shouldn't be surprised by it. You shouldn't be surprised by it. And I don't mean because they're crazy or they're nuts. I mean because they subscribe to this theory. Yeah. And if you subscribe to queer theory... Well, then, of course, it's a bad thing for you to not be able to discuss certain issues with kids because they need to understand this. They need to know it. They're going to engage with it. They, they may have two daddies. They may have one daddy that's into kink. And, uh, gosh, if you can't express this, then that student's going to feel isolated. They're going to feel confused. They're going to feel ostracized by their peers. Right. So if you subscribe to this, then they're, they're you know, their desire to want to talk about this stuff, even with, with kids, smaller kids, smaller or uh, younger kids, well, for them, this just kind of makes sense. So queer theory is a field of critical theory. Oh, my gosh. What do you know? 
So both CRT and queer theory come from critical theory. And what did we already say about critical theory? <laughs> has a lot of problems with classical liberalism, has a lot of problems with things like property rights, has a lot of problems with capitalism or free market economics. Very, very critical of American institutions, legal, social, political, and economic. Right, And here we have another theory that's making its way out of the university into your kid's school. Queer theory is a theory of critical theory that emerged in the early 1990s out of queer studies, often formerly gay and lesbian studies and women's studies. The term can have various meanings depending upon its usage, but has broadly been associated with the study and theorization of gender and sexual practices that exist outside of heterosexuality and which challenge the notion that heterosexual desire is normal. All right. So keep in mind, this is not just the study of, you know, human sexuality. This is essentially challenging in the narrative that heterosexual relationships are somehow normal or should be seen as normal or have any sort of, you know, originally it was, we're going to see heterosexual relationships as um, morally and equivalent from a utilitarian standpoint as every other sexual relationship, right? So that's part of queer theory. Is this in your schools? Well, again, you're going to be told it's not, right? We're just, we're, we're just talking about sex education. We're just talking about inclusion. We're just talking about making sure that students don't feel bullied because of their sexual identity. Well, here we go. And again, I'm going to go right back to those of you that think that because you sent your kid to a private you know, Christian school that this isn't going on. Let's go ahead and play this real quick. This was at a Catholic high school in New York City. And this was put on there by the person on TikTok he goes, I literally went to church to teach the children today. A Catholic high school here in New York City invited me to their pride chapel. Visibility matters, and I'm so honored to have had the chance to talk to you about my work as an LGBTQ plus drag queen activist. And they're actually in the Catholic church, which presumably is also providing the education. All right, so this is going on. I, I don't know. Maybe parents were informed of this. Maybe they weren't. Let's go to the next one. This one we're actually going to play, and what this is, is talking about gender is not out of the realm for children. The most understanding people when it comes to my identity have been the students that I work with. Go ahead and hit play. I'm a non-binary elementary school teacher, so here is how I talk to my students about pronouns and such. Hi, my name is Mix K. It's Mix. So kind of like cookie mix or mixing bowl. So she talks to kindergartners. That's how it's pronounced. That is my name. That is the name that I'm comfortable with. It is the name that makes me happy, and I would like it if you referred to me as such. See, that's I'm not a grade. mister or a miss, so I go by mix because that's what makes me happy. Second grade. Now, you have a name that you like to be called other than the name that's on the paper, right? It's the same thing for me. Third I grade. have a name that I prefer to be called, and that's the one that you're going to use for Okay, me, pause. Okay? So, uh, you know, again, we have, a, we have an elementary school teacher. This is, this is not... This is not mean Nick Freitas. This isn't, you know, mean Christian Hines or Nick Hamilton saying, oh, they're going into your classes and they're teaching your kids about it. Teachers are happy to go on and talk about this stuff. Yeah. Right. Which, which leads to other questions too for kids, right? Because if you're sitting there as a kid going, what do you mean you're mixed? Like, what, what is that? And then I love this statement, right? The most understanding people when it comes to my identity have been the students that I work with. I wonder if that has anything to do with the fact that preschoolers don't have what you might call the strongest grip on reality. <laughs> this, we don't usually make policy decisions or we don't usually leave policy decisions in the hands of preschoolers. Three and four year olds. Well, this is the other thing to keep in mind, right? There's another reason why you've seen, I've seen, I don't know how many videos like this. We're going to show another one here. I think later, how many videos where it's, it's young elementary school teachers and preschool teachers talking about how accepting the kids are They're They think that a fat guy in a red suit delivers their presidents by magic, <laughs> right? They believe in unicorns people, All right? Yes. They're very accepting of concepts that don't necessarily best reflect reality. And, and the fact that you would say that, oh gosh, I really want to talk to them because they just, they reinforce my they just identity. just get me so much. Like, are you, are you serious right now? Well, it, it makes it, I mean, children are impressionable. I mean, at, at yeah. the end of the day, they are, you can, t I, and, and many ways for good reason, because the human species would not be here if children didn't follow the advice of adults, yeah, don't touch the snake. Don't yeah. go chase the lion. Don't, I can't believe like, you would indoctrinate your child to treat snakes and but lions like that, that That's way. the reason that children are impressionable because they would be killed yeah. by nature because this is another thing that we might want to talk about at some point in the future, not in this episode, but like the state of nature sucks. 
And yeah. and I don't <laughs> Sorry, care Rousseau. what Henry David Thoreau says. Yeah. The state of nature sucks. And children would be dead if they didn't follow the advice of their older parents that have lived through hard times. But you know what? When you pervert that system, right? Because children will generally follow what adults have to tell them. Now, they might fuss and whine about it and try to test the rules and stuff like that. And that's naturally what children do. But by and large, if you direct them right, children will end up following what adults have to say, usually, not yeah. always. But when you pervert that into something like this, you are effectively indoctrinating them into something that doesn't actually really comport with reality. Well, It, it just doesn't. And, and I, I hate to break it to some of these people, but the internet is not real life. And this is super popular on Twitter. This is super popular on the internet. It's super popular TikTok. on TikTok. But this is not how the world works. And we are setting up children for failure. No, and you, and you might be thinking, well, like, look, she's just talking about preferred pronouns. Like, no, what she's offering is a different view of reality yeah. to very young, impressionable kids. And, she's, and she may very well be doing it without the knowledge of the parents who don't necessarily want their kids to be taught that version of reality. Let's go to the next one. This is a Florida teacher uh, and, and basically got her students together to, you know, protest the, the bill in Florida. What do we say to the don't say gay bill? So oh my gosh. again, you've got it. So not, not only the, now this teacher is calling it the don't say gay bill, which everyone has gone over a thousand different times. That's not what the bill did. The bill in general said, don't talk about sex with kids third grade and younger. Which, of course, means that she's got to get all of her high school students together, or middle school, I don't know what it is, I think it's high school, and, and you know, protest against this by saying queer instead of gay. Let's go to the next one. Okay, this is a picture of a drag queen teacher, writes about the pleasures of sharing my drag to students. So this is a French teacher in San Francisco that I don't know, I don't know if this person showed up to school or just showed the picture or whatnot. But By the way, for the audience yeah. at home, Nick found these things. Yeah. Uh, this is the picture <laughs> I took before going on stage. I am so happy with the amazingly positive response that I got. And I'm thrilled to show students that you can be whoever the hell you want to be. So there you go. All right. Next one. This is all libs of TikTok too. Okay. This one, I, we're going to listen to this one. Go ahead and go ahead and play it. Hi, I'm Linz. I'm a queer and trans educator and children's performer, creator, writer. You might know me from my web series, Queer Kid Stuff, where I talk about gender and sexuality stuff for all ages with a preschool audience in mind. Oh and I write God. for preschool television, do a lot of stuff in early childhood ed. The short answer? Wow. Uh, so first <laughs> off, don't you just love it when the first thing that defines your identity as a human being is your sexuality? So that Notice is how they introduced point. themselves. Yeah. The first thing they said was, I'm queer. Well, and, and this is an excellent point because this is, this is why I go back to this whole idea of, um, you know, so many people look at this like, I can't believe they're doing this in preschool. And, and she goes on to explain, or the teacher goes on to explain how it's important to talk about preschoolers, about gender and sexuality. Like this is, this is not something where she's hiding this. Mm -hmm. She's advocating for it. Like yeah. at least, at least this person's being honest about what they want to do. Now, here's why I tell everyone that, again, understand that if you subscribe to queer theory, if you subscribe to this notion kind of rooted in critical theory that everything's about power structures, and if you subscribe to this idea like the whole Maslow's hierarchy of needs where self-actualization is the highest human attainment, right? You being truly you. And who gets to decide that? You do. If you, put, if you put sexual identity and sexual pleasure as the most core component of your identity, and if you believe that that is the most core component of your identity, well, then of course you want to share that with other people. And of course you want other people to accept that as being morally equivalent to their own worldview with respect to determining you know, human worth, and of course, it's something that you would want, that's a theory and an idea about reality that you would want society to adopt. And if you genuinely believe that that is the good, moral, and just way to view reality, then of course you'd want to teach it to kids. So the, the real yeah. debate that's going on here is not just about what do you, 
if you are going to accept this view of reality that your sexual identity, which is deeply rooted in what you get sexual pleasure out of right now, because that's why they talk about fluidity. If you believe that as the core attribute, which defines you, then this is necessary. I say it goes even beyond. The, it's not just about the, the the sexual aspects of it. It's the it's it's really about the identity. Because because I I know a lot of social conservatives that are getting upset about this for obvious reasons, but from just a philosophical perspective. I find it equally disturbing that it's the emphasis on on a, a piece of identity that that makes you somehow better than ordinary people. I, I actually wrote something to a friend of mine last night about stuff like this in general. And and I'll make it really brief, but I definitely think it's worth rereading this. And I, I, I told this person, for the last 500 years or so, the trend line has been clearly set towards emphasizing that all human beings have inherent worth and value. This has been the bedrock upon which classical liberalism rested upon for centuries. It is this view, which has never been fully realized, that drove the Enlightenment, the push for, for representative systems of government, the destruction of feudalism and serfdom and slavery, and eventually most forms of institutionalized discrimination against people based on their race and gender. This bedrock is crumbling, however. Classical liberalism is giving way to a postmodernist ideology— a successor ideology that prioritizes intersectionality, social justice, identity politics, and anti-racism, increasingly at the expense of conventional liberal values of pluralism, freedom of speech, colorblindness, and free inquiry. This is why we've seen the growth of intolerance towards differing opinions, as well as the explosion of loaded terms like cancel culture, wokeness, and social justice warriors. This ideology has basically completely overtaken traditional left-wing politics, particularly among young people our age. I was talking to a friend similar age of me, right? It's this form, um, it's a form of authoritarian utopianism that masquerades as liberalism while usurping it from within. It's also why people on the left, especially in younger circles and in places where they feel much more confident to express their views out of a belief that they hold a hegemonic monopoly on public discourse in certain venues, Twitter being one of them, TikTok being one of them, and, and so do college campuses being one of them, tend to be rather heavy-handed in enforcing norms they believe should govern human behavior. If you step out of line, you get banned or punished or shunned by these people because the act isn't just stepping out of line. It's an attack on the very utopian worldview these people hold. And because utopias are, by definition, a place of ideal perfection, Anyone who opposes it must have nefarious or otherwise selfish motives for doing so, as no argument can discredit the establishment of such a perfect society. And then I end with, as a result, any measures to erect a utopian society can be morally justified by those who seek the utopia. These justifications cannot develop overnight, but if left unchecked, they can and have unleashed the darkest elements known to human nature. We experience those elements in the form of, you know, being discriminated online, like being kicked off of Twitter or banned from TikTok. But that's just the extent. And, and then I go on to say, you know, that's just the furthest extent that the powers that, that be on those platforms can can exert on somebody else. But that's just because that's the Internet, yeah. right? The worst thing that can happen to you is you get banned from from Twitter because that's the extent of Twitter's power. But apply this to the real world. You see this on college campuses where, where the, the, the infractions that are, are leveled against people that, that step out of line are way worse than being kicked off a platform. Now, imagine when that is being enshrined into law. Yeah, That is when things get really, oh, really dangerous. And, and the moment someone says, You see oh, this in Canada. Oh, that's ridiculous. That's not going to happen. It happened in it Canada. It is happening. They, they're literally doing this in the Western world, in places that you like Canada, like the UK, in places where you would expect they would have some basic protections for freedom of speech or freedom of religion. You're, they're finding out they don't. Germany is finding this out. Germany has rules against hate speech. And it was funny because it was uh, Crowder brought this up to somebody. And they're like, oh, that's ridiculous. I live in Germany. He's like, okay, well, then you know that if you say, well, no, if you say something hateful, they'll investigate. Like, you don't have freedom of speech if they can investigate you and incarcerate you for saying something that they've determined as hate speech, even if it didn't manifest itself in any sort of act of violence or the encouraging of an act of violence. Right? You said something that the state has determined is mean, and so now they can lock you up or some way punish you for it. Yeah. And, and again, for anybody that's looking at this going, 
Nick, all they're doing is talking about like pronouns and trying to respect other views. No, that isn't all that's going on here. What do you have to say when somebody says, because everything that I just said, I already know what the response from the left is going to be. Yeah. You just want to have the freedom for hate speech. Yeah. You're, it's not about differing. Opi- I get this all the time from people on the left. Yep. You know, we can't, it, it, it's not that we can be friends just because we disagree. You are against my existence. Yes. You're, and, and, and you, you see this where it's, it's not just, we can agree to disagree. It's not just, I have my view. You have your view. It's not even the, the actual postmodernist view that, you know, my truth versus your truth. Yeah. It's even beyond that at this point, it's, you disagree with me and you're evil yeah. because if you, di- you disagree with well, me because I am a good person and, and, yeah. and everything that you say, you don't just want to, this isn't like we're disagreeing on, on what's the best type of car or yeah. what paint we should paint my bedroom. This is, you know, you're against my identity. Mm-hmm. Well, how do you respond to the left who so, somebody on the left or the center left even that, that will, will say, this isn't just about a simple disagreement. This is about, you know, basic oh, human my, decency my existence this like, is, yeah. i hear that all the time like the, you'll, you'll see people make that claim against like matt walsh or jordan peterson or whatnot where they'll say you're denying like, to josh hawley they did it in yeah. the center you're, like, you're denying the existence you're denying the existence people. of yeah. trans people and it's like no i don't agree with the truth claim you're making and then the and you see what they do immediately next where it's like you know and with all the violence that has been registered like what you're doing is inciting violence let me make something really clear here I don't believe, I think some people do this for this reason. I think a lot of people, when they automatically claim the moment you disagree with them on something like, uh, you know, transsexualism or pansexualism, whatever it is, the moment they say that's inciting violence, they're not telling you that so that you'll stop saying it. They're saying it because we look in violence in two different ways, aggressive violence and defensive violence. If I come across this table and I punch you in the face, that's aggressive violence. If you then punch me back or wrestle me to the ground and get me to stop, that's defensive violence. And morally, we look at those two things very, very differently and for good reason. But if I can convince people that the moment you say something that I find offensive, you're engaging in an act of violence, and what does it free me up to do? I could be defensive. I can now engage in an act of violence against you, and I'm morally justified because I'm merely defending myself, or I'm defending an innocent third party over here, which you're inciting violence on. I've got a piece of advice for the listeners of this show. When somebody on the left says you disagreeing with me is an act of violence, they are not accusing you of violence. They are telegraphing to you what they're about to be doing. Yeah. Hmm. And, and, and again, and they will use whatever powers they have. They, their favorite one is government power, but they're not afraid, afraid to use corporate power too. We've seen that. We've seen the way that wall street and Silicon Valley operate. They're certainly not afraid to use local government too. They will use whatever means they possibly have, because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the left doesn't necessarily care about preserving our institutions. They, they don't. It, for, for all of the talk of Donald Trump being the terror down of institutions and an attack on our democracy, these people would burn the country to the ground if, the, in fact, they did try to burn the country to the ground two years ago. They would burn this country to the ground if they think that that's what would be necessary in order for them to achieve their worldview. And to rebuild it within their, their image. Okay, I got one other thing we got to show. Um, I actually spoke yesterday to a group of parents on, on a similar topic, and there were some things that I had to pull from my briefing because there was kids there, there were small kids there, and I just didn't think this was appropriate for them. But if you look at this, and if you're, you're not looking, this is, a, this is basically screenshots, and I blocked them out because, you know, this is going to go on YouTube, um, even though this is allowed in our schools, apparently. But this comes from the book Gender Queer. And for those of you who can't watch, what's actually going on here is they're actually showing, they're depicting in a, in a cartoon um, two, I, I guess, boys engaging in oral sex, right? And then there's another depiction of them engaging in another form of sex. And this is available within our schools. This was in Fairfax County. Yeah. Keep in mind, this has been all over the country. Parents have been actually like finding these books in their schools and just been like, you've got to be kidding me. Well, in Fairfax, parents stood up. So again, this isn't far away San Francisco, not far away from New York. This is Fairfax County in Virginia. Parents came and said, why do you have this book, Gender Queer, which actually shows, you know, again, depictions of this. And then there was another book called Lawn Boy, which actually describes in detail pedophile uh, pedophile sexual uh, encounters. 
And so Fairfax School System, this is in the uh, Washington Post, Fairfax School System pulls two books from libraries after complaints over sexual content. This was on September 28th, 2021. Okay, so this is right before the gubernatorial election in Virginia. Election's over. Youngkin gets elected. Fairfax Schools put it right back in November 23rd. So a couple weeks after the election, they put these two books right back into your kid's school district. Now, does this mean these books are in every school district in the Commonwealth of Virginia or in every school district within your, your state? No, not necessarily. But do you know? Have you called your superintendent? Have you called the school libraries and asked them if this book is available for your kids? What do you it, do when people say you just want to ban books? You're, you're a Nazi book and, burner. And, and, that's, and, and it, isn't that fascinating that the moment we said, like we actually came up with a rule in, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We tried to pass it. Democrats stopped it in the Senate where we said that if you're going to include sexually explicit material in the kid's lesson, like in their book report, you have to notify the parent. We didn't say you couldn't do it. You had to notify it. You know, said, oh, that's soft censorship. Because if the teacher has to ask every parent before they put sexually explicit material in the, in the content, well, then they're just not going to do it because why would you waste your time? Because one parent would, good, don't do it then. Like, are you really telling me? I'm like, I'm sorry. Are we so lacking? in important literature, which discusses difficult and complex concepts, that we have to resort to the ones that have explicit sexual material in them to include things like bestiality and rape. Like it's just so important that a 15 or 16 year old in AP English class have access to that book. Like my gosh, how could we ever prepare our kids for a 21st century economy if they don't have access to sexually explicit material in their AP English class in high school? I'll do you one better. I don't want to hear a single word from people about censorship or book burning or hiding information from the same people that were demanding deplatforming people for saying that vaccinated folks can spread COVID, which by the way is a fact. True. And it was like three weeks ago or a few months ago that you were being banned from Twitter for saying something that is an empirical, absolute statistical fact. That if you're vaccinated, you can absolutely spread COVID to somebody. And I remember not too long ago when that was considered the the height of conspiracy theories. Yeah. And, and, and that anybody that said that is a right-wing extremist who at best deserves to be banned perpetually from social media platforms. And and, and that, that is the most lenient position that people on the left were saying. I remember some people on the left that were saying that we need to mandate vaccines on people and find them and punish them if they refuse. I remember in Austria... There were a whole bunch of people in the left in Austria that literally tried to mandate vaccines and throw people in prison and find them for refusing to do so. And so many people ended up protesting it that the government finally gave in and 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 stopped trying to impose the program on people. But the point is, is that it notice how over and over and over again, the left accuses people of the very things that they themselves are guilty of. Remember that that guy, that school teacher in, in Hawaii? Hawaii? Yep. School teacher in Hawaii got on got on Twitter and like if you looked at his Twitter profile, it was all about how he was a socialist high school teacher, you know, educating children. And then he went on and made this thing and he goes, You basically goes he's talking to like parents and when he goes, You people effing like you 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 act like we want to effing show kids porn. He goes, But one thing I've learned is that whenever the right wingers are doing this stuff, it's because they're projecting. And shortly after that, that teacher was actually arrested. And if you look at the articles for it, it was like, oh, he was arrested for distributing porn. Yes, porn that he made with a student on school grounds, which he was sharing with another teacher. So in, in the midst of this teacher doing this, he still had the audacity to go on Twitter and say, anybody that's accusing us of grooming because we're having these conversations with our students is just projecting. Now, if you didn't think any of this was bad enough, let's go to our final article here in the San Diego School District sparks outrage by claiming that heterosexuality is a system of oppression and encourages students to call themselves two-spirit. So, the San Diego School District, second largest school district in California, we're going to go over some of the stuff that they were pushing on their students. So let's go ahead and scroll down. And this is what's interesting about this, because they were talking about things like privilege. They were talking about how heterosexuality is essentially um, a, a component of the oppressor-based system. And this is where you see an intersection. Keep in mind, 
CRT and queer theory both originate with critical theory. Critical theory is all about the study of power structures, which again, very critical of religion, Christianity, very critical of this idea of objective morality, very critical of classical liberalism, free market economics, etc. So they're now, they're now adding heterosexuality to that component of the oppressor class. So now you're in the oppressor category, right, for being heterosexual because society imposes this view that heterosexual relationships are normal or the standard. We well, yeah, kind of be tough for any of us to be here if it wasn't. That's not society. That's that's like right? basic like, biology. Like I, I got news for you. If we were down to the last two people, we'd all be really, really hoping. Hopefully, we'd all be really, really hoping that they were willing to copulate with one another in order to create more people. Well, actually, that's a whole other discussion. But there's a large part but of anyway, the left that would not. Yeah, the large part of the left would be fine with that arrangement. But here's some of the slides that they actually went through in the San Diego Unified School District. What is porn? What might be the intent of the question? What knowledge do they need to make healthy choices? How can you make your response inclusive of all students? Is it okay to masturbate? These are also, you know, these are also instruction materials that we definitely want our teachers and schools sharing with our kids. Here's another one. How do gay people have sex? Because that's definitely a question. I mean, before we get to anything like reading or writing or being able to understand, like, I don't know, basic American history or civics, we, we definitely want to go over this with our kids in school. But let's go down a little bit farther because this is where it gets really interesting. This is the part that just, again, beyond the pale, right? And the district encourages teachers. So here we go. All right, there we go. Yeah. In a related presentation, scroll down a little, and in a related presentation, the district advises teachers to lead discussions on how to use a condom as well as how to engage in safer oral sex and safer anal sex and to address questions like, what does semen taste like? This is your public schools, people. This is your government-run schools. All right, for all of us, for all of us that we're saying that Maybe it's not a good idea to hand over responsibility to government officials to discuss questions like sex with your child. And for everyone that told us that we were all just a bunch of, you know, radical Puritans. Did you ever sign up for your child going to school and learning about what semen tastes like or how to have safer oral sex or safer anal sex? Did any of you sign up to have that taught to your child in a school? And then you, you have the audacity to tell me and every other parent that's looking at this going, this is not appropriate. And telling us that, oh, that's because you're part of a heteronormative oppressor class. Ladies and gentlemen. You can't reason with some people. Ladies and gentlemen. But here's what you need to understand. If you buy in to queer theory, to critical theory, to critical race theory, this isn't crazy. This makes sense. In fact, you opposing it is what's crazy. And even when you bring up that this isn't appropriate for the this isn't appropriate for kids. Like even if you're willing to say, look, if, if you want to do this as an adult, fine, but but you don't get to push it on kids. Their response is going to be, yeah, that's right, because you want to stigmatize everybody that's not heteronormative, you oppressor. Now I want to wrap all this up with one other thing to consider. If you're a parent. One other thing to consider, and we've said so much stuff to get us banned on this. I'm, I love it because it needs to be said because there's so many parents out there that feel completely isolated as if, as if everything they knew about reality is just coming down around them and they feel scared to actually speak up. No, you don't have to feel scared about telling the government this is not appropriate for your child in the school that your tax dollars pay for. But there is a reason there is a reason why in certain schools, and Bill Maher of all people brought this up, where when you have 20% of a classroom identifying as trans, you, you think that's just because of, you know, they don't feel discriminated against anymore and now they can be their truer self? Or do you think that maybe certain attitudes and behaviors and worldviews are being pushed on them within their institutions of education and this, here's the other thing I want to point out. This is the intersection, right? That's a, that's a term they all love. Here's the intersection with CRT and queer theory. If you are a white cisgendered boy or girl in a classroom and you're being told that heterosexual or heteronormative behavior is a part of the oppressor class, 
And you're already an oppressor because you're white. You're already an oppressor because you identify as heterosexual, you know, male or female. What is the one thing that you can do right now, no questions asked, to move yourself from the oppressor class over into the class that's celebrated? Claim to be bi. That well, that's what white that's what white female like high school and middle school students are doing, especially in states where this is like really pushed. California yeah. is the one where it's like in some future episode, we need to talk about this some more and I will dig up the stats because it is astonishing, yeah. like the percentage of, Generation of people. Z. And and by the way, it used to be that we would define somebody as LGBTQ based on on actual you know, like hard metrics, like, like, are you actually physically attracted to the same sex or do you actually feel you transgender or whatever it is? Sex, yeah. yeah. But, but now it's, 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 a, it's a shield that I think some people latch onto in order to avoid being stigmatized themselves. The, the amount of young TikTokers that have massive followings yeah. that claim to be bi is incredibly concerning. Yeah. No. Well, and, and again, it's, it's, you don't get to say, and this is the part where, where the left likes to come in, and, and the, the first response is always, this isn't happening. And then you say, no, it, it is happening. That's the, that's the San Diego School District. This is the Virginia Department of Education website. That's the policy for the Illinois School District. This is an official statement by the Virginia Education Association. Like, this is happening. Mm -hmm. Then it's like, oh, well, you're a bigot. Right? They, they, they say it's not happening. Then they misrepresent which is actually happening. Then when you show them irrefutable proof, well, it's because you're a bigot, you're a sexist, you're a transphobe, you're, you're this, you're that, whatever it is. And it's because, again, if you've bought into their theory and their worldview, well, then, yes, all of this is not only okay, it's something to be encouraged. Because if you don't encourage it, then you're making a moral statement that there might be a difference between these two things. That there might be some sort of moral, or at the very least, utilitarian difference between different types of human relationships. And if you've accepted what I believe is the false premise that the core fundamental foundation of your identity is based off of your sexual identity or sexual preferences, then of course they're going to push this in schools. It's the only way to change society to think in line with this. Yeah. And, and if you are someone that comes from either a traditional background, and maybe that's just because you think there's such a thing as objective reality and objective biological reality, or you come from someone that believes those things and also you're, you're a Christian or you're a Muslim or you're an Orthodox Jew or you're a Sikh. And you think that there's, you know, there's not only differences between men and women, but there's actually an objective moral order or code that you believe is absolutely true. That, that doesn't make you a bigot. They have a truth claim. You have a truth claim. We should be able to sit down and debate about that or at least have a discussion about it, but now we're just being told to sit down and shut up, you bigot. That's because the words are violence crowd refuses yeah. to engage in honest debate because, quite frankly, there is no debate. These are also people that, that believe that, that it's true that there is no truth yeah, and, you know, believe that there are no beliefs. <laughs> so, like, it, it is, quite frankly, you can't really debate with somebody that that – he doesn't want to show up to the debate and just wants to shut you down. And I think that's where conservatives are increasingly at because for so long, conservatives have been trying to just engage with people and debate. And, and it's not, it's actually quite sad the direction that, that we're going, because I feel like that, that some of the things that you, that, that kept society together, mm -hmm. just basic things that you, that you could go outside and, and you could recognize that the sky is blue and that trees usually have green leaves, except in the fall. Yeah. And that, you know, water flows downhill. Like, well, and, and, and again, those things are still intact, but there were other things too that were yeah. universally believed just as much as those. Yeah. And those things that kept society together for so long, I feel like are starting to crumble. And, well, and they acted like, and, one, and I love this term, well, that's a social construct. Okay, well, <laughs> why does the social construct exist? Does it exist because there was an accurate reflection of reality taking place? Or does it exist because they were manipulating reality? Because you can have social contracts that are good. You can have one contracts that are bad. The question is, is how does it reflect reality and what's the perspective on reality being used? You know the biggest social, social construct of them all? Government. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I, I, the, one of the things I'll, I'll say on that is that um, 
again, but part of the big problem here is is it's it's not recognition that me saying I disagree with you is not violence. You know, me saying that I don't I don't agree with your truth claim is not me denying your existence as a human being. But the reason why I think they say that is not just because it's off putting to say like, oh, no, no, it puts you on the defensive. Like, I don't want to say I'm not saying you don't exist. You don't have value. I'm just saying I don't think you're a girl because you're a biological boy. Right. Part of doing that is, again, it's a strategy to shut down debate, not to foster it or not to get to the bottom of figuring out what the truth is, because they've already determined that their perspective is more important than any sort of reality that both of us could could recognize together. Mike, I got two questions here, and then I'm going to yeah. ask you to summarize all of this for us. But if, if a parent, parent is having a conversation about this topic and they're told, well, this is about inclusion and fighting against bullying, what would your response be to that? So th- this is always the part that gets conservatives kind of, again, on, on, their, on their back foot, right, on, on their heels. Because it's this idea that, you know, if you don't accept this or, or, or if you don't actively encourage it and celebrate it, then you're being mean. You're being divisive. You're being, you're discriminating. If a child thinks they can fly, you don't walk them on top of a 10-story building and say, you know what, I'm going to encourage your identity as someone capable of flight because that would be irresponsible. When you encourage some, when you deliberately encourage someone's dysphoria, you're not being compassionate and you're not being tolerant. And more and more what I'm seeing is the exact opposite. I'm seeing people that want to push a particular worldview or a particular philosophy about reality, and they're willing to use kids to do it for the reason that Christian mentioned. They're impressionable. They also create very, very vulnerable victims. And then what they do is they create this reality, which encourages that dysphoria and that confusion, and then they put themselves in between the child and you as if they're the one defending the child from you by encouraging the dysphoria. Like in in no other case in psychiatry or psychology would we tell someone that is believing something that is obviously untrue, does not correspond with reality. In no other area would say, oh no, we want to totally encourage this sort of behavior. Because it's, it's potentially destructive and damaging. So what I would tell the parent is the moment someone tries to make this about they're the ones, like, no, no, no. There is a very clear distinction. I will tell anybody that if you're going to go up and you're going to bully a kid with gender dysphoria, you're a punk. And that kid needs to be disciplined. If if you're going to bully a kid because they've identified a sexual preference toward the same sex or to a bicycle, I may not agree with that. I may not think that is healthy sexual behavior. But I'm certainly not allowed someone to bully them over it. By the same token, I am not going to allow someone else to attempt to indoctrinate one of my children and act as if I'm standing up to defend my kids because I don't agree with what their worldview is trying to project. I'm not going to be treated like I'm the bad guy. And the more parents that act like, the more parents that act defensive about coming to their kids' rescue, the more they're going to do it because they can tell in that moment, you're not serious, you're breaking And quite frankly, I owe it to my kids to say, no, 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 no. I do believe there is such a thing as objective reality. I do believe there's such a thing as objective morality. I do believe that your identity comes from being beautifully and wonderfully created in the image of God, and nobody ever can take that away from you. And you shouldn't allow anybody to try to supplant that truth with this idea that you are nothing more than your sexual identity or preference. So... The thing I would tell parents is do not be intimidated. It is a tactic. If they have the truth on their side, they wouldn't have to argue in the way that they're arguing. If they have the truth on their side, they wouldn't have to lie to you about what they're doing in your kid's classroom. Then they wouldn't have to try to cover up or misrepresent what they're doing. And then they wouldn't have to come back around and try to treat you, make you feel like you're a bigot because you finally got to the bottom of what they said they weren't doing. Last question here. So what should parents do if they see this going on in schools? I, I think there's a, there's a couple of things that parents are going to need to do. Um, a lot of parents, let, let's talk about the most obvious option. You can remove your kids from the school system. Now, a lot of parents will come back and say, I don't have the money. I don't have the time. I can't do that. We need two incomes. I, I get it. I get it. But before you decide that's not an option, I really would ask you to, in, excuse me, to investigate it. 
I, I know a lot of parents that say it's not an option because they have no idea what homeschooling is actually like. Right. It's not they, the same as it was. No, they have been told what homeschooling is like from a bunch of people within a government-run school system that don't want them to homeschool. Right? They've been told by all the advocates against homeschooling that they couldn't possibly afford to it or they don't have the credentials for it or they don't have the time for it. Now, if you decide that homeschooling is not for you, I'm not going to sit here and try to make you feel bad about it. I'm not going to sit here and tell you to make the same decision I made. I don't believe in that. I don't believe, I'm not here to tell you how to educate your kids. But please, don't be dissuaded from considering something from the very people that don't want you to consider it. Because they benefit by you not considering it. So that's the first thing I would ask you to do. Take a look at options but besides the one the government is, intentionally, is essentially imposing on you. If you can't do that, the second option is get to know your teachers. There are a lot of great, wonderful teachers out there. I, 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 would, I would argue that the majority of teachers are good, wonderful people that just want to educate their kids and really don't want to get caught up in all of this. Now, I have no idea what percentage that is because when you send a teacher through four to eight years of college where they're getting inundated with this and going into the classroom, at some point, I don't know how much they truly believe in this and are pushing it. I don't know the ones that are, are you know, quietly trying to resist this because they just want to teach your kids how to read and do math. Right? I, I don't know what that percentage is. But you need to understand something. And we used to always talk about this in the military. This is part of this whole concept of extreme ownership, right? Yep. You can delegate the authority for educating your child. You cannot delegate the responsibility. So do I believe that you should go out and find people that are, are highly educated, that got a passion for education, that are really good at it and like to do it and have studied intently? Do I believe you should go out and ask those people for assistance and help them and pay them to assist you in the education of your child? Absolutely. Absolutely. But do I believe that you should just hand them off without asking any other questions about what they're doing, what they're teaching, or how they're teaching it, and say, well, you know, they're the expert. You can do that. You're still responsible. Nothing takes the way the responsibility from a parent to be actively involved in their child's education. Nothing. So please get to know what is actually going on within your schools. And the last thing I would tell parents, and this is really, really important, if your child is going into an environment that is openly hostile against your worldview, your faith, your political beliefs, and they come home and they start to ask questions and you get mad at them, you are sending them right back into the arms of people that probably don't care about them as much as you do. Because if the other side is going to be wholly accepting, not, not only are they going to be accepting, but they're going to offer them all of these things they can try and experiment with and tell them it's good for them and part of their true nature, which is denied to them at home. If the home and you as a parent are not the safe place that they can come back to and ask difficult questions, it's not that they won't find one. They will. It just won't be you. So as intimidating as this all is, when I say, <laughs> when I say you can't give up, you, you cannot surrender the responsibility for your child's education. I mean, like, literally, you can't do it. It's impossible. And you, you have to be prepared. If you're going to send them into that environment, send them in prepared and be ready when they have some hard questions and don't get frustrated when they ask those questions. And if you don't know the answer, that's fine. You can tell them, you know what? I don't know the answer, but I'm sure there is one. Or well, let's find it. Let's find it together. Because you never want to get into a situation where your child doesn't feel, that your child feels like they can talk to anybody but you. So let me, let me just sum all this up. There's a reason why you're seeing all of this converge in your schools right now. Right? It isn't just critical race theory in isolation. It isn't just queer theory in isolation. This all roots from critical theory. Critical theory is not just kind of a neat academic idea about legal structures. It is a lens for which to view reality and to explain disparities. And if you adopt it, it makes sense for them to do the things that they're doing. If you disagree with that, that needs to affect the way you educate your kids, the way you parent your kids, the way that you teach them about reality and philosophy. It needs to affect the way that you vote because these are two diametrically opposed worldviews. And the last thing I want to make clear here, for all of their talk about them being the compassionate, tolerant ones, they're the ones trying to use government force, government money, and government authority to impose this. 
I have repeatedly gone to the General Assembly and advocated for more individual liberty, more power for parents, more freedom to make individual decisions, to include a whole host of decisions I don't agree with. But I am I respect your right to be able to live your life the way that you want, provided you don't infringe on the rights and liberties of other people. And in to the degree that I disagree with you, I will attempt to do so peacefully through conversation and convincing, not the coercive power of government. So before you step up to me or any other parent that has a problem with this and say that we're the bigoted intolerant ones, just remember that the vast majority of us are perfectly fine to let you make decisions as an adult for your children and for yourself. But the moment you attempt to impose it on the rest of us through the power of law, that is where we draw the line and we will not apologize for it. Because insofar as you have the freedom to make decisions that we might find harmful to you, we will respect your ability to do it until it starts to attach, attach itself to our kids. And then we're going to defend them. All right. I hope, listen, I hope the people listening to this, watching this, found this helpful. Um, look, school, school year is about to start. And you need to know what's going on in your kid's school. Regardless of what you decide to do with their education, you need to know what's going on in the option that you choose for them. Because as long as they're kids, they don't got a choice. You make it for them. And that's why you can't give up the responsibility. You literally can't get rid of it. It's yours. So own it. Love your kids. Be there for them. Educate them well. Teach them how to critically think. Teach them to know what they believe, why they believe it and how to stand up for it when it's appropriate. All right, thank you very much for watching. We hope you got a lot out of this. Please leave us some comments. Join the Volley Chat, and we'll see you next episode.